My name is Shadia Khabal. I uh, work at the Institute for Astronomy at the University of Hawaii. And I've, uh, my broad specialty is solar physics, and my research has been focused on observing the outer atmosphere of the sun, which we call the solar corona, during total solar eclipses. And I started that research direction in 95, and I've been doing it since. Eclipses offer unique opportunities to study the outer atmosphere of the sun uh, because um, the sun is too bright to see it. It's just like you don't see stars during the daytime, but the stars are there. So it's the same thing. The corona is always there, but we can't see it because you have the solar disk that's so bright. The difference in brightness between the two is about a million times. So the corona is a million times fainter. So during a total solar eclipse, when the moon blocks the surface of the sun, it dims everything to about the level of nighttime or dusk. So stars appear, uh, planets appear, and the corona appears. So the Earth, fortunately, has a magnetic shield. But so this magnetic shield, you can imagine it's like a big bubble of a balloon, a membrane. And every time it it's hit, well, it's continuously hit by the solar wind, so it, it kind of moves in and out, you know, it varies. But sometimes the sun produces these huge explosions, and then the punch, if it's towards the Earth, then the, the Earth's magnetic bubble will feel this punch. And it can have uh, dire consequences on telecommunication satellites, er Earth orbiting satellites, etc. So from a pragmatic point of view and, uh, you know, the impact on our human day-to-day -day life, understanding the solar wind is very important and understanding where it's coming from and whether we can predict when it's going to produce these huge bubbles. It's one thing that we're hoping to find this year because the sun goes through a cycle of activity. It's about 11 to 12 years. So it's all driven also by magnetism. And when the activity increases, the likelihood of having these huge explosive events, which we call coronal mass ejections, becomes higher. There are more of them. Now, with the type of instrumentation we have between the imagers and the spectrometers, if we can catch a coronal mass ejection, it would be really lucky because we can analyze it analyze its chemical composition, analyze the temperature distribution in this coronal mass ejection, and analyze how everything is changing between the three observing sites. So that would be a really a unique opportunity and a novel one. Pixels, and it's very fast, so the download time is very quick. We used to have cameras where for each frame it took one second to, one second to download, so we lost a lot of time when you have it an eclipse, but now it's almost like, and it was only through my theoretical work that I realized that one... Uh, Your fascination with the, uh, you know, solar uh, study. It actually started to uh, see the difference, and they also have an acromat here. So the filter here has, is in a housing that keeps it at a controlled temperature. And then the acromat is here, and then you need all the 300 millimeter, and then you have the cameras. So the uh, how fast uh, different ion species are moving, how hot they are, and just what's in the sun's corona uh, based on their specific. Uh, so um, I guess first thing we're using this. This is just an off-the-shelf telephoto lens, but for all intents and purposes, the telescope. So that's our objective. That gets focused through us. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. So. The art construction paper, you know. I would say let's get a big case from upstairs, you know, or uh, in your you know, the curvial boxes, uh -huh. the boxes, the cardboard. Oh, oh, oh yeah, under and put, the... put these inside and then take 